We're going to use our, our whiteboard again this morning just to kind of help us visualize um, some of the truths that we'll find in Scripture this morning. First of all, <coughs> I want to once again read to you, for those of you who weren't here on Wednesday, to read to you the headline <coughs> from the Evan Hell. The headline from our Wednesday night Evan Hell. <coughs> It says this, it's three sentences, invasion begun, conquest inevitable, resistance futile. Invasion begun, conquest inevitable, and resistance is futile. And then these are the this is the Bible verse. First of all, from Romans chapter 14, 11, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge God. Every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23, it says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also the one to come. Speaking of Jesus, it continues to say, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. It's speaking of the authority and the sovereignty over all of Jesus Christ. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 then says, that at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and under the earth. The first one says, every knee will bow to God. The second one says, all authority has been given, placed under Jesus' feet. And then the third one says, every knee shall bow in the name of Jesus, or to the name of Jesus. And so this morning, in fact, I think I'm just going to bring this down so I don't have to walk back and forth. This morning, the conclusion of our message is about that. So I'm going to write our conclusion down here. And we're going to work our way to this, okay? That's where we're going. A lot of times when people are traveling along with our messages, they're like, I wonder where he's going. And usually I don't tell you ahead of time so that I can travel us along. But this time, I'm going to give you where we're going. Jesus is Lord. At the end of all, the end of all, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I want us to remember, does anybody remember last week what the message was last week. As long as I'm down here, I can. For those in our television audience, church, our television audience is the back section. They don't want to be here really. So, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. And then look back here in my soundboard. Half of the church is sitting all the way back behind a wall back there. Wow, that's our international television audience over there. Wow, I kept wondering why there's so many chairs back there. Oh my goodness. Let me get as far away from the front as I can get. There's still a hallway in another room back there, guys, if you, if you want. Okay, so this word... We're going to talk about this word today, and this is not going to be so much a sermon today as a lesson, okay? Um, but we're going to talk about that word right now. So first of all, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. What was last week's message about? Some, someone, does anybody remember? The box, right, and the only way that we could actually see is he reveals himself. The, there's no way we can figure out who God is on our own. There are certain things we can know about him, 
but unless he reveals himself to us. And that's what he does, and he uses the word of God. Now, in addition to that, then he, he calls us, now those of us who have seen that are no longer blind, he calls us now to reveal him using his word through others. Remember, how can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can they preach unless they are sent from the book of Romans? Okay, and so, but remember when that message started, what we talked about at the very beginning of it was the definition of life. The definition of life is to know the one true God and Jesus Christ him, he sent according to John chapter 17, 3. But we can't know him unless God reveals himself to us. And he has done that. And so knowing him is to have eternal life. Well, in that case, knowing him more would give me what? Well, it is everlasting life, but it would give me what? Knowing him more gives me what? Okay, knowledge, which is more life. Now, you could go, how could I have more of eternal life? Well, are there some days when you wake up and you feel really blue and other days when you feel like you're right in the center of God's will? Jesus says, if you abide in me, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will bear much fruit. And it speaks about a filling of the Holy Spirit, but it speaks about a refilling of the Holy Spirit as well. That as we walk and as we journey with the Lord, we come to know him more. And it's not just data. It's not just facts. We end up in relationship with him. And as that relationship grows, your life in Christ gets bigger and bigger and bigger. David says this about his relationship with God. He says two things from the same guy, guy after God's own heart. He says this, as the deer pants for the water. So my soul longs for you. Do you, you hear the, the cry, the passion, I want more. I can't get close enough, I want more. The same guy says, my cup overflows. There are times of, of, of feeling, I want more and more, and then there are other times where you just sit in the dust and say, God, I am undone. You are too close, too full. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm coming apart. As I, as I am becoming more and more aware of your presence and who you are. It's our response to revelation. Knowledge and facts are not enough. Relationship is what is needed. They go, they go close together. Eternal life is to know God. That's not to know of God. It is to know Him. So when we look at this word Lord here, we're going to find some very revealing things about God in this word, okay? First of all, if you'll turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3, <coughs> verses 14 through 15. By the way, is there anyone here who feels that, who feels as the deer pants for the water, my soul longeth after thee? Does anybody feel that great passion to come closer to him? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of the number one reasons we go to church every single Sunday, isn't it? Trying to satisfy that hunger. I hunger and I thirst for him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Okay? In Exodus chapter 3, if you look, uh, verse um, uh, 14 through 15, can I get somebody to read that, please? Anyone? Go a little further, please. All right, so Moses is saying, who do I tell them you are? Well, God could have just said, you tell them that I am the one true God. You tell them that I am God. What did I just say? I am. There's this issue of existence. But then God goes on to say this. You tell them God sent you. You tell them I am who I am sent you. You tell them I am sent you. You tell them the Lord, the God of their forefathers is sending you. Well, which one is he? All three. All three. But anyway, from this passage of Scripture, we, get, we, have, we have a couple of different 
issues with this word Lord. Let me move the word Lord up here. And what we have when he says I am is we have the consonant, consonants. What have I got wrong here? Thank you, Y-H. I can't even spell that right. Come on. Y-H-W-H. When he says I am, Y-H-W-H, which means what? Okay, well, let's see. We have a difficulty with this. As most of you know, I am colorblind. Did most of you know that? I am colorblind. I can't see many of the colors. So if I were to ask you, Louis, what is blue? What would you say? Could you define blue for me? You say the sky. See, you didn't tell me what blue is. You told me what the sky is. Right? Am I wrong? Is your jacket blue? See, I can see the red, and usually when they have red, the blue goes together with it. So, so if he would say, well, blue is like my jacket, what does he say? I'm not, he's not told me about blue. He's told me about his jacket. I want to know what blue is. How can I say what Yahweh is in context? See, if I could see color, and you said, this is how you learned color. Your mom or your teacher, whoever said, that's blue, and 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 that's blue. And you went, ah, now I get it. Those are all blues. Is there only one blue, or are there more than one blue? There's more than one, right? But do you see through experience as you're coming into contact, and so you have context. And so God says to him, you tell them Yahweh. Well, what does that mean? Yahweh. That's who I am. There are over a thousand names for God. Over a thousand. But there is only one name of God. It's this one. And so what does that look like? All right, so let us consider for a moment. You'll notice he says that you tell him I am sent you, but then he also said, and you tell him the Lord. In your Bible, is it capital letters or is just the first letter capital? Look and see. Just the first letter? Then that means it's the Hebrew word Elohim. In your Bible, in the Old Testament, whenever it's capital L and small O-R-D, the Hebrew word is Elohim. Whenever it is all capitals like this, the Hebrew word is Yahweh. In your New Testament, whenever it's the large L and the small in the New Testament, the word is Kyrios. Greek. These are Hebrew. Okay, these are Hebrew, and then this one is Greek. In fact, what I read to you about Jesus being Lord that Lord is this word. Okay, so I've got titles, and then I've got a name. It goes something like this. Let us say that I handed you a business card. On the business card, it would say that I'm the pastor of Vista Hills Church. Is this who I am? And then it would have, it would have the church tel telephone number on it, and it would have the address on it, right? Is this who I am? Well, yeah, sure it is. I am the pastor of Vista Hills Church. But then let's say that you turned it over and I wrote on there, my name is Randy. And here's my cell phone number. If you don't have it, write it down, please. What have I just done? This is who I am, but this is who I am to you. This is, this is one of the thousand titles. But in that title, in all of the thousand titles, the person is here. In fact, what we find, this is who he is as covenant God. And the only way that you have covenant is him in relationship to someone. This is who he is. This is his title. This is who I am to you. This is the relationship. Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1.
Did anybody have trouble finding that? No. In the beginning, God created. There's the word God. In the beginning, God created. That's that word Elohim. It's not the word Yahweh. How does it appear there? It's a, instead of Lord, it's using the word God because that's what Elohim is. Elohim or Adonai, either one can kind of be my God. Okay? But Yahweh, if you look in Genesis chapter 2, watch how it plays out. I'm going to start at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed. Oh, I guess, let me pause for just a second. What are we saying here? We're saying that in order to have life and to have it abundantly, it's not that I need to confess that I become a very successful real estate agent. In order to have life and to have it abundantly is to know God. So if your eyes are kind of glazing over right now, going, where, what, what are we doing? We're learning who God is. And that is abundant life, okay? It says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, Elohim completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctifies it because in it he rested from all his work which Elohim had created and made. Here, Elohim is not his name. Elohim is his title. The title really is God, but remember we're talking about what is blue. In context now, what is God? Notice I didn't say who is God. In context with this passage of Scripture, what is God? Creator. Very good. God is creator. Blue, 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 blue. I'm starting to get it. Creator, creator, creator. He is creator. In context. I'm starting to get it. Now watch what he does. Verse 4. This is the account of the heaven and the earth. When they were created in that day, Jehovah or Yahweh. Oh, we changed words. God is no longer using Elohim. Suddenly he is using Yahweh. You notice I slipped and said Jehovah. Let's talk about that for a moment. So here I have the word Elohim. And here I have the word Yahweh with no vowels. So in the 15th century, some genius thought it would be a great idea to slide these vowels between these consonants. And because it's Latin, you don't, back then in the 1500s, you didn't have the Y sound, you had the J, which in Spanish, by the way, a hard Y is kind of a J sound, isn't it? Yeah. Do you understand where the word, yeah, yes, yes, yes it is. <laughs> do, you, do you guys, yes, I have a chevy. Okay, do you, do you guys see that this, this is not how God wrote it? Some genius in the 1500s, it's a transliteration because they were trying to reconcile these two. You don't reconcile him. He is Yahweh. In fact, when the Hebrew people, they were so afraid of using his name in vain that they would, they would say this instead. <clears throat> 6,510 times in the Old Testament. 6,510 times. Do you think we can get some context? Do you think we can figure out what the color blue is if you have 6,510? So here what we have is Elohim now in chapter 2. Elohim God. Yahweh Elohim. The Lord God. Yahweh Elohim. Pastor Randy. Made earth and the heavens, and the shrubs of the field were yet in the earth, and the plants of the field, and so forth. Why suddenly is it Yahweh, the Lord God, planted a garden, verse 8, verse eight toward the east in Eden, and there he placed man? Do you see the relationship beginning? 
Yahweh is who he is in relationship. He places man there. Let us consider for a moment, creator, what does it tell me about him? It tells me that he is the maker of all things, but is he good or bad? I don't know. He could be a horrible creator. Have you ever seen a child that made something just so that they could tear it apart and break it and have fun destroying it? He could be that, couldn't he? If all I know is he is creator, then all I know is he's maker. I don't know anything else about him. He is my creator. He is man's creator. And in this sense, he is Lord. He is Lord. As creator, he has authority and he has power. Look, if he can make you, he can unmake you. It tells me nothing about relationship. It does tell me this, a little something about him. He is powerful. The beginning of wisdom, the Bible says, is the fear of the Lord. He is creator, but I don't know whether he's good or bad. But then as I read, Yahweh takes man and places him in this beautiful garden. Now what is beginning to unfold? He is good. Not only is he creator, but he is loving creator. This name, the context of this name, the 6,510 times it is used in scriptures, tells us not what he is. It tells us who he is. God tells me what he is. The word Elohim tells me what he is. But this tells me who he is. So let us travel a little bit. I want you to remember where we're going is. We're going to Jesus as Lord. I want to travel a little bit through the scriptures and see how this plays out. And I won't keep you much longer. Remember that, that our desire is to know him because as we know him, that is the definition of life, okay, of eternal life. All right. So in the beginning, we have Elohim, Yahweh, I keep doing that, Elohim Yahweh created. And he places man in a garden. And here is where man lives, right here in this garden, okay? And there's how many trees? How many trees are there? Lots and lots and lots and lots of trees. Lots and lots. Lots and lots of trees. All of the trees. And God makes an exit. There's only one exit. You could eat of every one of these trees and not leave. But there is one tree. So God makes an exit. And here it is. Just one exit. No other way you're ever going to leave this covenant. He is Yahweh. And I am man. He is Father, and I am Son. We are in a relationship. Not one I made. Who made it? Elohim Yahweh made it. Nobody told him to make it. He just chose to do so, because that's who he is. How did I get into covenant with him? Did I do something? I opened my eyes and there was his face breathing into my nostrils. The breath of life, his life, was breathing into my nostrils. Is he good creator? He says, it's not good for man to be alone. Let me make a helper for him. And out of his bone, he makes, he makes her. And now the two, the two together, are mankind in relationship in covenant. All is good. He is so good, so wonderful, that he made an exit. Now, I'm sitting here going, could we just do away with the exit so I could stay with you forever? If there's no choice, 
there is no love. How can I stay in relationship, in covenant with him, unless there is the ability to leave covenant with him? And guess what they did? They could eat of any one of these, but they ate of this one. Now, why did they eat of this one? Why? Because they didn't want to be in covenant with him anymore. I'm like, oh, Adam. <laughs> if hindsight being 2020, Adam, if you had only known, they did not want him. It wasn't the garden they didn't want. They wanted to stay in the garden. They just wanted him out. But he can't leave the garden. He's creator. So if I don't want him, I've got to exit. So we exited. What was it that we wanted? Well, we didn't want Elohim Yahweh. We wanted Randy God. And Mitch wanted Mitch God. And Gray wanted Gray God. And Jean wanted Jean God. And now we're here. We're all living down here. Knowing him, meaning covenant with him is eternal life. What have I got here? This is the already and not yet dead. I have the down payment of death. I'm living here under a cloud, under, under conviction, under judgment. The Bible says, Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to judge the world. The, ju the world stands condemned already. What was it that got me into this place? Ready? Here's the word. Are you ready? Here's the big word. Disobedience. How do you spell that? There we go. And let me get rid of this one. Disobedience. That's how I got here, didn't I? It was the act of disobedience. Whatever you do, don't eat from this tree. I'll eat what I want. There was only one way out to disobey. It broke the covenant. And so here we are, living under the shadow of death. In a matter of speaking, notice I said already and not yet, the Hades, the realm, the realm of the dead, the walking dead. How many of you like that series? That's who we were. Heart beating, muscles moving, insatiable hunger, and no life. No longer men, no longer women. The walking dead. Under conviction un, or under condemnation, notice it's already and it's also not yet. I am not in the lake of fire, but that's where I'm going. Here, I am blind, blind guides leading the blind. Here, there is no revelation. Without revelation, Psalm says, the people perish. Here, there is nothing but perishing. Here, there is no light. There is nothing but darkness under the cloud of God's judgment. God made an exit. God made an exit. How many exits? Do you understand why there can only be one exit? There was one act of disobedience. The only way back is the act of obedience. What obedience? What he commands to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus enters in. Jesus comes into this place, not from here and not from here. He comes into this place from above. He descends he doesn't disobey. He doesn't sin in order to get here. He doesn't sin, so he doesn't come this way. He comes from the heavens. He comes from Elohim Yahweh. I keep doing it. He comes from Elohim Yahweh 
and he is Emmanuel, which is Elohim Yahweh here with us in this place. Look at what he says in John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus. Truly, I truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs in some other way, he is a thief and a robber. There were a lot of people who came into this place and said, let me tell you how to get out of here. Let me tell you who God is. Let me tell you, a guy named Buddha, Herr Krishna. They're always coming into this place. Jesus is saying, all of those people are thieves and robbers. I'm the one who came in. See, none of them came from heaven into this place. They all came from here. Fallen sinners. Only Jesus came, the sinless one, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and enters into this lost and fallen world as perfect God and perfect man. He's saying all of the rest of them were nothing, but here I am. Do you understand his words? I say to you, he who does not enter the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs in some other way, he is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. (laughs) He leads them out. Anybody want out of here? Yeah. Who leads us out? Anyone else lead us out? No. He leads us out into a new place. In fact, let's read a little further. He says, <clears throat> verse 5, A stranger they simply will not pop follow but will flee from him because they do not, uh, because they do not know the voice of a stranger. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to them again, Truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Okay, so he is the shepherd that leads us out, but he is also the exit. How does he make this exit in this place? Can somebody tell me? How does he make the exit? Dies on the cross. He dies on the cross. He obeys the Father. The book of Romans tells us, whereas all of the sin came from one act of disobedience, all of the righteousness comes from one act of obedience, the obedience of the Son of God on the cross. He takes man's place. It was a tree that got us in there. Hallelujah, it was a tree that got us out. (laughs) He hangs on a tree. Man, all man, but also Yahweh. That's when they came to him and they said, and what does he say to them? Jesus says, I am. Before Abraham was Yahweh. Before Abraham was and God, the Son, points to himself. Before Abraham was Yahweh. Yahweh hangs on a tree cursed to make an exit. He calls us out into this place. Well, what is this place? This is Hades, the realm of the dead. This is what? The realm of the living. You're born again. Already, but not yet. Or already and not yet. Already and not yet. What what's going on here? Did I simply did I simply leave here? (laughs) Friends, as I passed through this door, I became a new creation. Because this guy can't live here. As I go through the door, I die. I die. And I am, 
created again. And so what do I have? I have Elohim, Yahweh, Creator. And I am in covenant. Jesus says the three pronouns. Your, your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask. Your, the pronoun, your Father in heaven. And he says this, my Father in heaven will. And then he says this, and when you pray, our Father in heaven. I'm in covenant relationship with him. But I'm also a new creation. Well, what is that new creation? See, we've got the already and the not yet. Here there is light. But the sin nature is still there too. Already I am redeemed. Already I am righteous. Already I am destined Already, already I, I am seated in the heavenlies, but at the exact same time, not yet. It's mine. I have the down payment. I have the Holy Spirit. The anointing is on me, but I don't have the completeness of it. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I'll ask you to turn there, please. First of all, let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 5.17. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Then he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 21, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. In fact, Paul says, therefore, when I sin, it is not I who sin, but it is sin within me that sins. So here I am in this realm now, and I am in covenant with God, but the fallen nature is there as well. And this is what causes that tension that you feel so much. This is why David is able to, this dichotomy as the deer pants for the water. And yet at the same time, my cup overflows. You are living in a divine tension between the new creation and the old. It's not a whole lot of fun, is it? It's a whole lot better than this place. Do you remember when you were lost and dead in your trespasses and sins? And let me just pause for a moment. Friends, if you are here and you are dead in your trespasses and sins... God has made an exit through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, save me. Obey that. Jesus, save me. And you exit into this realm. Do you remember the difference? Can you, Gay, you speak of this many times. Once you're here, do you want to go back? No. When the, when the sinful nature causes you to struggle and to sin. Do you, do you enjoy that a lot? Do you relish that? Do you go, man, I wish I could sin more? No? What do you say? What did Paul say? Who can help me? Who can help this wretched man? What a wretched man I am, but praise be to God, he says. So here we are in the already and the not yet, the realm of the living. We are in Christ. We are knowing God. But Paul says, now I know in part, then I will know in full, now through a veil. I will know as I am known. I will know completely some, somewhere else because God has made an exit. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to stay here. There is an exit. 
when my heart stops beating and my brain function closes down, don't cry for me. I just, Elvis is no longer in the building. <laughs> I just, I left. Or if we tarry until the Lord returns. You see, there is a resurrection coming. There is a day coming. Well, then what about this? Jesus is curious. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. In this place, here. Oh, by the way, let me populate this a little. Bernie, Jay, Pierce. I miss them. All my mentors. But would I bring them back? No. Where are they? They exited. At the end of time, all of those who refuse to obey the gospel and are still here will be raised from the dead and they will stand before Jesus. And all of those who did obey the gospel and accepted him as Lord will raise from the dead and they will all stand before the judgment seat. Those from this realm will confess Jesus is my Lord and those from this realm will be forced to confess Jesus is the Lord. We will enter into heaven, into the place of reward that our Father has given us, and they will continue their journey from the not yet to the fully now, their journey into eternal condemnation. So let us just con conclude with this thought. When we think about God as eternal life, we know of someone in the scriptures, Jesus told us about a man who left here and entered into his, eter into his eternity. And he was in a place of torment where he thirsted. Could you imagine if, if God is the author of life if God is the source of life, if God is all of the life that there is, and you're in a place where he isn't, can you imagine the unbearable thirst for him, for life? To be in that realm, see, you make it, it, it seems like as though it's, it's, it's just, you know, the fire, it, it, the thirst you hear it in David as the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts, so my soul longs for you. That man in Hades was saying, just a drop of water. Just, could I just have one tiny bit of the life that God is? Never, ever, ever, ever. It will be an eternity separated from him and he is the only life there is. It's not an annihilation. You will continue to exist. But existence and life are two different things. See, that word, I am, I am existence. I am the existing one. I am the one who gives existence. The to be verb. It deals completely with existence. You will continue without the author. And there's no exit. No exit. Now here's what's glorious. Here, as we move into here, it is filled with the author. There is no light. Don't need a light because God is there. Remember when it says that in the book of Revelation? The author of light permeates all of it. I will no longer thirst because I will be filled. And can I tell you a secret? There's no exit from there either. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Now, while we're here, friends, while we're here, there are two ambitions. Here, what caused us to leave was ambition. I want to be God, Eve said. This was ambition. I want to be God. While we are here, we have two ambitions. The first one is this. I want you to look back into this realm. And I want you to plead with them. As I said last week, if you can't tell them the gospel, invite them to come here where they'll see Jesus Christ in the body of his believers. You've got to be looking back here, not wanting to go back there. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. All, all that we are in Christ, all of the obediences that we do now are not in order to get here, by the way. When the Pharisees came to John the Baptist and said, repent me too, he said, go, go, do, go do deeds in keeping with repentance. What is the evidence of your repentance? Here, see, here we're going to be, we are doing the things that come from being in covenant with him. We don't try to do them. His people do things. One of the things his people do, a light to the lost, a fisher of men. You, you, you look back here while, it's, while the sun's shining and you can make hay, you make hay. And you're also looking here and you're persevering until this day. That's it. And you're delighting in knowing him. You're delighting in knowing him. Do you get it? All right, so let me pause for a moment. Let me push this out of the way. What did you hear this morning? Someone tell me, what did you hear this morning? Okay. What do we need to do to have eternal life, Herb? Yeah. Obey that gospel. Believe. Yeah. Who else heard something today? What did you hear? Yes, Brandon. I want you to notice that. I asked you what is blue. You say, the sky. I ask you who is God. One obedient act. That's who he is. Uh, see, I can't put that into words, can I? That's who he is. Blue. Right? That's who he is. Who, what else? What else did you hear? Yeah. <laughs> As C.S. Lewis would put it, God still loves these hairless bipeds. He loves them. Otherwise, it would already be over. He loves them. And we need to. What else did you hear? Creator, Father. Yeah. Okay, supposed to be fishermen. Anyone else hear something else? All right, perfect. I got three answers at the same time, so I'm going to go through them. No, no, it's good. You couldn't hear. You said one word, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When we look at the color blue and we say, what is it? It's the sky. When we look at Yahweh and say, what is it? He is covenant, which is personal relationship with mankind not with all of creation so to speak but with us for sure wow God is relationship it's why the word father as Ray pointed out God is father God is Lord all of those other thousand names provider protector all of blue 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 as you walk with him, you get to know him. Carolina, what did you say? He gave us an exit. And one day there won't be any more exits. <laughs> I just need one more. <laughs> and then, Asa, what did you say? Yeah. 
Yes. He came in the flesh that we could see him. He stood in front of Thomas and said, Thomas, touch, place your hand. Thomas drops to his knees and says, my Kyrios and my Elohim. My Kyrios and my Elohim. The risen Jesus gives us that covenant that we're in now. Personalized, right? 